So this morning we're currently in Romans, I believe it's part 21. We're moving into chapter 11, which if, if you've been following this series, you'll know that this is now the third and final chapter of this segment that deals primarily with the nation of Israel. So again, a brief recap, which is always helpful, especially when you're as forgetful as what I can be. The first eight chapters are dealing with so much doctrine that all relates to really God's righteousness. How he has demonstrated his righteousness right from the beginning. And we see that through the fall, all mankind needs a saviour. And that, that through faith in the saviour, we're justified freely as a free gift. Every single person. And for those who receive that justification by the work of the Holy Spirit, we experience an ongoing sanctification in this life where we become more like the one who has saved us. But it's by his Holy Spirit. Again, we cannot live this Christian life. It's only God living through us that we can live this Christian life. By following his word and believing his word and in the power of his spirit. And as you come especially towards the end of chapter 8, we see that God has already glorified us, even though we will experience it future-wise. As far as God is concerned, it's, uh, it's as God has done. It's a promise that he has given to glorify us with his son. And it's a truly amazing thing. So, as we've seen, the question arises then from that, well, with all these promises to the nation of Israel that throughout the Old Testament, has God finished with the Jews? And if he has, how can God really be a God of truth, a God who upholds his word? If his promises to Israel have failed, or even been spiritualized away, how can we be sure that his promises to us will hold, or not be spiritualized away? How do we know that we've understood them correctly, to really give us some conviction and assurance? A big part of these three chapters answers those questions, and we also see as well that God is glorified in his purposes for Israel. And we'll start to see a bit more of that in this chapter. So again, chapter 9 was, again, really primarily dealing with God's past election of Israel, his choosing of the nation. Chapter 10, dealing more so with their, their current situation, their need for salvation. But again, looking forward to the future restoration of the nation, which comes out more now in this chapter, in chapter 11. Now, Lord willing, we'll maybe take two weeks to cover this chapter. Um, so, this morning, I would like to try and get to chapter, sorry, to verse 15. So, I'll read from Romans 11, verse 1 to 15. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite. Again, remember this is Paul speaking. I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people who he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they have torn down thine altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. So that's Paul quoting what Elijah said. And then Paul says, In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice, or God's choice of grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? That which Israel is seeking for, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened, just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let the table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, did they not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. 
But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So, if we go back to the beginning of this chapter, Paul says, I say then. So clearly he was following on, and I know I often repeat this a lot, he's clearly in this first verse following on from what he has just said Verse 19, 20, and 21. He's speaking about the same group of people. He is not moving on to talk about the church or even at this point, the saved remnant of Israel. He's speaking about the same group of people that is spoken of in the previous verse. In chapter 10 and verse 21, it says, But as for Israel, he says, God says, he quotes from Isaiah 65, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now, I forget about the Greek. I didn't even know what obstinate meant in English. So I had to look it up. But it's always better to look it up in the Greek. It means dispute or refuse. So the nation of Israel are being described here as people who are disputing with God especially about who his son is and refusing to believe it. This is the same group of people that Paul is speaking about in chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people. Whose people? God's people. Israel. It's not changed. And Paul says as proof of this, but I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people who he foreknew. So Paul is saying if God had completely rejected Israel, if he'd completely finished with them, because of them being a disobedient and obstinate people, rejected his son, I wouldn't be saved. No Israelite will be saved. And it's worth pointing out because Paul in other areas, in other letters, uh, doesn't really put himself in a glowing light as far as his past as a persecutor of the church. You remember him stood there when they were stoning Stephen to death, laying their garments at Paul's feet when he was still called Saul, dragging men and women out of their homes and putting them in prison because they were followers of Jesus Christ. So, if Paul can be saved, a Jew persecuting the church full of murder, if Paul can be saved, any Jew can be saved. And that's important to remember for everybody because we go on to reading about how Israel as a nation has been hardened that's true, as we will see. But again, if Paul can be saved, just because the nation has been hardened does not mean for a second that no individual Jew can be saved. So, Paul goes on to use another example from the Old Testament of Elijah. So he says, and this is, I, I, until coming to study this passage this last week or two, I'd never realised what it actually says here in verse 2, that Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. Really, Elijah was Israel's first great prophet. I mean, there was prophets before, you know. Um, Moses was a prophet. David was called a prophet. But as far as kicking off this, this time of prophets where God was coming to Israel through the mouths of prophets to warn them, Elijah really is the figurehead. Amazing man. But got to the point where he's actually pleading with God against his own people. I saw that and thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. But before we give him too hard of a time, let's just remember why he was pleading against Israel and why he said what he says in verse 3. Verse 3 is a quote um, from 1 Kings 19, starting around verse 10. Isaiah says to God, look, 
they have killed the prophets. They've torn down your altars. I alone am left. And they're seeking to kill me. They're seeking my life. So if we go back and remember what had happened. Elijah was speaking against Ahab. God had shut off rain. Elijah prayed there was no rain in Israel for three and a half years because of what was going on. Ahab was the most wicked king of Israel up until that time. Married a Sidonian woman called Jezebel who was basically pulling the strings and she was absolutely wicked. And so at the time in Israel, Jezebel had seduced Ahab and the people of Israel to worship Baal. This wicked Canaan god, Canaanite god. And if you remember, Elijah had this great showdown with the prophets of Baal. I think there was 400 of them. And he said to them, he offered that he should do him a challenge. Look, if your God is the real God, you set up a sacrifice and an altar and call down fire. I'll do the same for my God, the God of Israel. And all afternoon, the prophets of Baal were doing all they were doing, their funny limp dance, cutting themselves crying out to the God and nothing happened. Elijah soaked his sacrifice, if you remember, it filled up the trench all around, soaking wet, straight away, fire came down, consumed everything, even the stones that was around it, showing beyond any doubt who the true God was. And at that moment in time, Israel bowed down and worshipped God. However, very soon after that, word got back to Jezebel, they were her prophets, they were working for her. And she wanted to kill Elijah. And no change really happened with the people. That momentarily amazing sign the people, you know, worship God. Nothing really changed. So Elijah ran for his life, really, to Mount Sinai. And it's at this point, he's had enough. He basically sits under a tree and he's had enough. And he basically says to God, I've, that's it, I've had enough. Take me life. And this is when he says this. Look, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. I'm the only one left. He thought there was going to be this great national revival. God, you have just shown yourself. You've shown everybody who you are. This is amazing. You know, rains come. People was worshipping you. But it didn't happen. And he's devastated. He's finished. This is the greater prophet Elijah. And this is why he brings into the point of saying, look, do you not see what your people are doing? I'm the only one left. And God's reply to him, or the divine response as it's called in verse 4, God says, Elijah didn't know this. I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. And so, this is quite an important truth throughout the Bible, going back to the establishment of the nation of Israel. No matter how bad things have been in Israel and Judah, God has always had for himself a believing remnant. Just because somebody was of the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob didn't mean they were saved in terms of receiving eternal life. Then, like we've seen, it was saved by grace through faith. National citizenship, that's, uh, that descendants from the patriarchs didn't save anybody. He gave blessings and privilege, but didn't save them. It was a remnant. And in the nation of Israel, at the time of Elijah, God said there was 7,000. And if you were sat in a church of 7,000 people, You'd think, wow, this is pretty good, isn't it? But for the whole nation out of millions of people, it's a speck, really. And I think something else to think as well here, you know, even as, as, as Christians, not exactly in the same sense. I think Christians, we can be susceptible to thinking, well, where, where are all the faithful believers? Because... You know, we, we can be honest and sit and see the state of the church at large, especially in the West, and see the apostasy and the false teaching and the madness that sometimes goes on. And it's almost like you, you, you can't go a few weeks or months without hearing of some other famous pastor in the news who's done something really bad. And he, there was another one recently. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But all these things keep happening and you're thinking, Lord, where, where's the faithful remnant in the church? But we don't know, do we? 
we don't know as, as, as bad as what we think a certain church might be. You, we don't know the hearts of everybody in that church. And as much as you can understand Elijah saying something like this and think, pleading against his own people, thinking he's the only one, understandable in a way, but it's not right, is it? Not right for Christians to be thinking that either. We've got to see things for what they are. But only God knows. And I thought it was interesting to see when you come into the book of Acts, 7,000 here in the time of Elijah, but when we come into the book of Acts, remembering that the church was almost exclusively Jewish up until chapter 10, when Cornelius and the Gentiles start to get converted. 3,000 Jews saved on the day of Pentecost. We go into, I think it's chapter 4, a load more saved than it says, they now numbered 5,000. And then as you go through the next couple of chapters, there's two more occasions where it says, and multitudes more believed, and multitudes more believed. So by the time you get to Cornelius, before the Gentiles started to be brought in, you could be looking at 10,000 plus, you know, way more than in the days of Elijah. Spread like wildfire, you know, it really did. But this teaching of a remnant is vital. We saw it back in Romans chapter 9, verse 27. Romans 9 and verse 27, it said, And Isaiah cries out, so Isaiah prophesied about this remnant, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. So this was prophesied way back when. And in verse 5, so back in chapter 11 now in Romans, Paul uses this example of how things were in the day of Elijah to say, look, it's the same now. It's the same now. Now we're living in the days of the Gospels of Grace. There is a believing remnant among the nation of Israel who is saved because they have received Jesus Christ as their saviour. Not because they're members of the nation of Israel, but because... They have believed. Now, verse 5, I'll read from an NASB. And I think the translation is slightly misguiding at the end of verse 5. It says, At this present time, there's a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Literally in the Greek and in some of the older translations, it says, according to the choice of grace. Which I think makes it clearer. According to the choice of grace. Or the choice of grace. Sorry, the election of grace. Meaning, the only way any Jew was ever going to be saved was by grace. The only way a Jew was going to become a member of the true elect or the chosen people within the chosen people, which I'll describe in a minute, was through grace. It wasn't going to be through works. It wasn't going to be through keeping the law. And it wasn't because they were a member of the nation of Israel. It was through grace. That was the only way. Now, where it says there, choice of grace or election of grace, what we are seeing in verse 5 is an election within an election or a chosen group of people within a greater chosen group of people. Israel as a nation, as we've seen in these chapters, were chosen by God. They were elect, not saved. But they were chosen for God's purpose for a number of reasons. And we see this in this chapter. If we go forward to verse 28 in Romans 11, we'll see this, what, what I will call the natural election, the naturally chosen people. Verse 28 says, from the standpoint of the gospel, and this is speaking of Israel, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the, so this isn't speaking about saved Israel. This isn't speaking about, you know, those who have come to faith. Couldn't call them the enemies of the gospel. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's election, God's choice, it's the same word as what we've just seen, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. That's national Israel. That's the nat natural election. The naturally chosen people, any descendant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But within that elect group, within that chosen group, there is a spiritual election. 
those who have believed and that are the spiritual seed of Abraham. Do you understand? There's a difference. And this is the people being spoken of in verse 5, back in verse 5. At the present time, there is a remnant according to God's choice of grace. Those within Israel who have believed. And this is who he's been speaking about there, because it's by grace, not by works. Verse 6, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And we've seen it time and time again through this letter to the Romans. That we are saved by grace. It is a free gift. Grace excludes works. True grace excludes works. And the opposite is true. And we've got to remember this. That works excludes grace. If grace excludes any works then it must also be true that works exclude grace. Meaning that anybody who is coming to the Lord wanting to receive salvation, eternal life, regeneration, to be born again, and we come offering anything of ourself, anything in terms of commitment, promises, um, even a desire to turn our back on sin, which is a good thing, we're trying to add to the work of Christ on the cross. We were sharing in communion this morning. We thought about it. Trying to add anything to this grace is almost like somebody trying to have some partaking of Christ's work on the cross. Let me add a little bit of my blood. Let me just do a little bit of something. It nullifies grace and cancels out salvation because it's got to be all of grace. We can't contribute a single thing. All we can do is receive it in faith. This free gift. And this is what Israel kept stumbling over. They kept trying to think that their works and their good deeds and keeping the law could change it. It should be so easy to accept a free gift. But we've got this thing within us that think that we, we've got to do something, I think, especially in this country. You've probably seen it anyway. Somebody tries to like give somebody, I'll, I'll pay for it. Oh, let me, let's go half. Oh, you want me to give you a little bit? No, just let me pay for it. That kind of thing. It says in verse 7, What then? That which Israel was seeking for, it is not obtained. What were they seeking for? It tells us earlier in the passage, back in chapter 10, starting at verse 3. And again, this is Israel, national Israel. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness, excuse me, to the righteousness of God. They were seeking righteousness. This is what they missed, this is what they stumbled over. And who is the righteous one? Who, be, who became our righteousness? It's Christ, verse 4, chapter 10. For Christ is the end or is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone. Who believes this was Israel's big stumbling stone Christ himself and the righteousness which he is is the same which we need and it goes on to say in verse 7 but those who were chosen the elect as we've seen the elect by grace through faith obtained it the rest were hardened now we're coming back to this principle of the hardening which we saw back in chapter 9. Remember we were looking, going back into Exodus, how Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He hardened his own heart and God went on to harden his heart even further to accomplish his purposes through him. It's God's chosen vessel to do what God wanted to achieve. And so, when we see this idea of hardening and a blindness we see a, 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 it's like a description of it in verses 8, 9 and 10 the three quotes from the Old Testament so what does this hardening look like it says in verse 8 quoting from Isaiah 29 verse 10 God gave them a spirit of stupor which is almost like a, a, a being asleep eyes to see 
not ears to hear, not down to this very day. And David says, quoting from Psalm 69, 22 to 23, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Sorry, that was from Deuteronomy. Back in verse 8, the second half of verse 8. It's verse 9 and 10, which is from Psalm 69. And he says, let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. So this blindness, this hardening, this blindness that's come upon Israel, they weren't born in this state. No individual Israelite, Jew, Gentile, anybody is born in this state as some teach. Some that hold to this doctrine that some are just born to go to hell and others are chosen to go to heaven and that's it. We'll go to things like this and say, look, but they're not born like this. People become like this. Pharaoh hardened his own heart before God ever hardened it. And as we actually go back and have a look, I think I've mentioned it before, you know, when we read these quotes from the Old Testament, it's always good to go back and see them in their context. And the quote from Isaiah in chapter 29. In verse 9. It says, be delayed and wait. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over them a spirit of sleep. There's the quote from Romans 11 that we've just read. They've blinded themselves back in verse 9. So again, what does this look like? They've rejected God himself, they've rejected the Father. Just like Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. The reason they rejected the Son is because, in reality, they rejected the Father. It's not that God made it that they can't believe and conditioned them from birth that they couldn't believe. In the Bible, people are blinded, people are hardened because they don't believe. This is how it works. This is how it works in the world now. 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. Again, the primary context even here in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 is the context is speaking about Israel. Speaking about the veil that is over their face at the preaching of Moses. And in chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God. It doesn't say that the devil's blinded people's minds so that they can't believe that God exists. He's blinded the mind of those who are already unbelieving so that they can't see the glory of the gospel of Christ. They've already turned their back and refused to believe that there is a creator God. So we've got to understand these things because, again, there are those who will teach that some people are blind from birth and there's nothing they can do about it. They are, they are incapable of believing from birth. And this passage is not saying that. There is an application to us as well as believers in the church about this idea of becoming blind and being hardened. Again, we can never lose our salvation. But Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4 teach that we can become hardened by sin. If we continue in sin as children of God, our hearts can become hardened. And the result of that is that we've struggled to hear God's voice. That we can come to the scriptures and read and read and read or hear and hear and hear. And it, it, the seed just bounces off us like seed bounces off rocky, stony ground. And never takes effect, never germinates. That's the effect that sin has on us. That's a horrible place to be in. And so, this is the idea of hardening. The rest will harden those who are of the spiritual election, who had believed, obtained righteousness that all Israel were looking for. But the rest stumbled because they were hardened. They were hardened because of their unbelief. Verse 11, 
Paul goes on to say, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. Because transgression, sorry, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now what does that mean? So, as we've seen, they stumbled. They stumbled over the way to righteousness. They stumbled over righteousness himself, Christ. I mean, it's worth just going back to the quote in Romans 9.33, where it says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offence. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. We know that speaking of Christ. But the question being raised in verse 11, well, if they've stumbled over Christ again, is, does that mean God's finished with them? Did they fall so as never to recover? May it never be. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? So let me, I'll just come on to this idea of their fall being riches for the world and for the Gentiles. But I just want to come on to verse 13 where Paul says, But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Another word there for magnify is, is, is glorify. It comes from the same word as, as doxa. To give glory. I glorify my ministry. Why? Verse 14. If somehow I might move to jealousy some of my fellow countrymen and save them. For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world... What will their acceptance be? But life from the dead. Wow. So Paul is saying one of the, the, the great motivations for him and his ministry in preaching to the Gentiles. Of course he wants to see Gentiles converted. But he knows that through his ministry to the Gentiles, some Jews seeing Gentiles getting saved bring them to a place of jealousy. And I think we looked at this in the last week or two. How? Why? When Jews see Gentiles who understand their scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and can show them, when, can, when they can see how much God has blessed his church, and think, well, look at us, look at us as a, as a, as a nation, as a people of Jews, it should spur, um, spawn jealousy. And this is a, something that I think the church is really missing out on. And so, with, with this in view, with this part of Paul's ministry, I, I, I think we've missed out as a church. I really think we've missed out. And I think some areas of the church are put off by these kinds of principles because there are other areas that take this idea of um, God's love for the Jews and how we should, you know, um, share in God's heart for Israel and things like this. We've seen there's areas of the church, Gentiles, that want to become Jewish. The areas of the church that think we've got to go back under the law and take it to the extreme and start speaking Hebrew. <laughs> you know what I mean? English speaking people to English speaking people speaking Hebrew. And it's all, you know, it, I think that puts people off. It's amazing how the devil can use things, but it shouldn't send us to the other extreme where we become like Elijah and start pleading with God against Israel. Well, look at them. But something quite amazing what comes out of these last few verses, this idea where by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Their failure has become riches for the Gentiles. Verse 15, their rejection has become reconciliation for the world. These things have happened to the nation of Israel. It not happened to any other nation. Just think about that for a minute. It's only Israel that God chose as his people. Again, not to, not to save them eternally. But yeah, to, to give them blessings. They had the scriptures, they had the covenants. Theirs was the adoption of sons. They brought forth the Christ. Didn't do that with any other nation. God's prerogative, as, as we saw, his choice. But the view was to bless the world through them. 
So why has God rejected them? Why has he hardened them? Why has he blinded them? Because we've got to understand this. We've got to ask, it's, it's, uh, ask honest questions. As believers, don't be scared to ask honest questions, even if they're hard. If you trust God is true and he is faithful, you ain't got to worry about it. But it's good to ask the question, why did God reject Israel? And as we'll see later on in this chapter, it's only temporary and it's only partial. But why? Why is he hardened them? Why is he blinded them? I was reading a book by a guy called John Wilkinson. He founded something called the Mill Day Mission to the Jews, I believe it is, back in the 1800s. He wrote an amazing book called Israel, My Glory. He's very, very helpful in pointing out three reasons why God has rejected his people. Because as we, we have a tendency to think it was just because they rejected Christ. And that's certainly one of the reasons and a big part of it. But actually, there are three reasons he listed and in Gen Deuteronomy 29... The first reason was because of their idolatry. You know, all of Israel's history was prophesied <laughs> in the Old Testament, just, just in the books of Moses. Deuteronomy's got some passages that cover all of Israel's history, past, present, and future, right up until the return of Christ. And you see, it, 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 like Deuteronomy was written 600 years or thereabouts before Christ came to this earth. Hundreds of years before there was any exile or anything. And it's all detailed there in Deuteronomy. It's absolutely amazing. But in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 24 to 28. It says, And all the nations shall say, Why has the Lord done this to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then men shall say, Because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went and worshipped and served other gods. Gods who they had not known and whom God had not allotted to them. Therefore, because of this idolatry, the anger of the Lord burned against this land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land. This is future again. Uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And cast them into another land as it is to this day. Idolatry. The first reason. The second reason. The rejection of the Messiah. They didn't recognize the time of their visitation. And I tell you, this, was really like, this, this guy pointed out. It actually takes you back to the beginning of Luke. In Luke chapter 1. I think it was Zacharias, John the Baptist dad, when he was prophesying. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. So yeah, Zacharias is prophesying and he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Now contrast that with Luke 19, verse 41. It says, and when he, when Jesus approached, this is approaching Jerusalem now, he saw the city and he wept over it. And we nearly finished. Jesus came and as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he started crying. Why? He said, if you had known the day, even the day, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. This is that partial blindness we've been looking at. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you, surround you, hem them in on every side, and will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave upon you one stone unturned because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. This was the arrival of the Messiah, as we've just seen from the beginning of Luke's Gospel. They refused their Savior, they refused their Messiah. And so God's wrath came upon them for that reason. One more reason that keeps adding to this hardening and blindness that has continued with Israel the last 2,000 years. And this is one that never came to my mind until I read this. In 1 Thessalonians, yeah, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. The Jews at large 
prevented or attempted to prevent the gospel from going to the Gentiles. The Jewish nation at large attempted to prevent the gospel of Jesus Christ going to the Gentiles. You can read how they did it in the book of Acts, but Paul clearly lays it out here in 1 Thessalonians um, and verse 14. He says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, the southern part of Israel. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. It's quite something. It's one thing to reject Christ. It's another thing to try and prevent others from accepting him. And so this is why this hardening and this blindness has come upon the nation of Israel as a collective as a, as a natural elect group. But as we've seen in the example of Paul, it doesn't mean that any individual Jew, no matter how religious they might be, no matter how wicked they might be, still cannot be saved. And so, as we see in these final few verses that we're looking at, well, if this is what's happened to Israel now, God has used this to bring salvation to the Gentiles. It was in God's purposes. Now we need to be careful. Israel's rejection didn't cause salvation to come to the Gentiles. The death, burial and resurrection of Christ on the cross caused the gospel to come to the Gentiles and the salvation. But it was Israel's rejection that provided the occasion for it to happen. So Israel's rejection of Christ provided the occasion for the gospel now to go to the Gentiles and salvation to be offered, accomplished in what Christ did. So if that, what it's saying in that passage, if that was the result of something like Israel's fall, how much more amazing it is going to be when Israel as a nation do come to salvation. Because we see in verse 25 of Romans 11, We'll see this next week, Lord willing. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Don't be ignorant about this. Lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and thus all Israel will be saved. This is their future national salvation. Not just a remnant in the days at the end of the tribulation. So Israel's rejection is not total because there's still a remnant gets saved and it is not final because there is a future salvation for the nation. What does this look like? How does that bring life to the Gentile nations? We see it in the millennial kingdom when Christ returns to save Israel. This is not the rapture, this is the second coming. And sets up his kingdom on the earth we read at the end of Isaiah and we're finishing Isaiah not at the very end of Isaiah but Isaiah chapter 60 Israel will once again be head of the nations the church raptured in glory in heaven that's our citizenship on the earth the nations that go through into the kingdom Israel head over the nations this is what we're looking at in Isaiah 60, verse 1, speaking to the nation of Israel, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, speaking of the nations. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear on you. And nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The whole earth is going to be changed. 
Christ will be at the centre reigning from the throne of David in Jerusalem, working through the nation of Israel to bring all the Gentile nations to Jerusalem to worship Christ. To be taught, as you go on and read in Isaiah 4, God's law will go out from Zion. The nations will come and learn from Christ. Israel will serve in the temple. This is how the salvation of the Jewish nation will bring this blessing to the Gentile nations. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we can see God's plan. We are finishing now. God's plan of salvation. There's this guy in the book, book laid like out. Four steps. And I never thought about it like this, but it's so simple. Four steps to the conversion of the world. We ain't going to convert the world. The church is never going to convert the world. The social gospel certainly ain't going to convert the world. You don't believe in amillennialism, post-millennialism. But there is a point in the millennial kingdom where you've got, in a sense, this conversion of the world. And the process is the elect Jews, God's choice of election, his choice of grace. And then from that comes salvation to uh, the Gentiles called out for his name. As James called it in Acts 15. Gentiles called out. He calls out a people for his name. And then from that we see Israel's national salvation. The salvation of Israel. And then from that we see the Gentile salvation. Salvation coming to all the nations. This is how God accomplishes his purpose of salvation. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So Lord willing we'll see more of this. In the rest of chapter 11. But what a thing God has done. He's always had it in hand, hasn't he? Always had it in hand. Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. And I believe, as I'm sure, I don't think I'm the only one, that we're coming very close to seeing the fruition of these things. You know? God's got it all in hand. The sea's foaming and roaring. But God's got it all in hand. He is on his throne and he is sovereign. So just close in a quick word of prayer.